All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Dr. Dolores Tarver. I'm a licensed psychologist here in Georgia, and it is time for the tea. Tea Time with Dr. Tarver is a wellness-based podcast. It is not intended to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health provider. Welcome back to May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we are talking about the things that are getting in the way of our wellness. So we're getting into suicide, depression, worth, criticism, inaccurate information, and stigma. And I'm so very excited about our guest on the show today who is going to be talking to us about something that's very important, which is our youth and their mental health. So if you have questions, please jump on the live and put those questions in the comment section, and we will be happy to try to answer those to the best of our ability. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get going. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Ambrose Pass Turner. Dr. Pass Turner is has a doctor of counseling. She is the owner of APT Counseling Services, licensed psychotherapist, professor, and author. She has worked in the mental profession, health profession for over 20 years. Dr. Pass Turner has published the books Rex's Journey, helping children understand and cope with emotions and the forthcoming ADHD Warrior, helping children conquer ADHD unwanted behaviors. So welcome, Dr. Pass Turner. Thank you, Dr. Tarver. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to have you. So I'm going to jump right into it because time always gets away. So I want to make sure that we try to get to everything that we have to talk about. So Mental Health America released at the beginning of May some pretty concerning statistics about our 11 to 17 year old youth, particularly those that identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, or our black indigenous people of color. And the statistics released were these groups experience higher levels of depression, more severe depression, and also higher rates of suicidality. So I want to start off by talking about depression and suicidality in our young people. Can you tell our, our viewers what are some of the risk factors? Well, there, there are many risk factors um, for um, teen depression, but some of the most common ones that we'll see is self-esteem issues with that. Um, such um, self, some people may be feel some children may feel bad because they may feel like they're overweight. Others, others may feel that they're underweight. Um, peer problems with peers, not feeling that you're accepted by your peers can also, and bullying and also academic problems can influence some of the um, risk for um, depression, but also family violence, you know, um, living in a home where there's a lot of violence, uh, poor communication skills. Uh, dysfunction of families can also, also children who have experienced some type of physical or sexual abuse. All those could be contributing factors to um, developing depression in children. So really any of our young people could be at risk. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I know we like to make it seem like it's not going to be my child, but we have all of these different risk factors that could be affecting your child. You may not know they might be getting bullied at school. Right. And maybe having some difficulty in their schoolwork, learning things, being able to even get through testing, uh, and also just the family dynamics that go on. We're dealing with a lot of things in our country right now. We just went through COVID uh, for the past two and a half years, had us not even really being able to engage with each other. And we know that our kids were affected by COVID. So, and then you mentioned family issues, which, I mean, how many of us don't have something that happens in the family, whether it's a loss? of a family member, or it may be a family member who may be going through some difficult time. So of course, our children are going to be witnessing and hearing about these things. So it is likely that they may be, it sounds like taking on some of these things and maybe having some difficulty with them as well. Yes, and when we look at the LBGT, the LBGTQ community, um, because I work a lot with that community, adults and children, but a lot of that is having to hide your true identity of who you feel who you are. And then sometimes having parents who are not accepting that, you know, you may be, um, your sexual orientation may be different because they don't believe in that type of behavior or things like that. So I see a lot of children, um, youth or, you know, adolescents uh, with self-harming behavior, but that is 
you know, you, you, if you can imagine believing that you're something else and you can't come out and share that. And then when you do, you're rejected. So I see a lot of that too in the LB, LBGTQ community. I think that rejection is a, is a pivotal point when our kids already, as we know, you're, you're learning and developing throughout your life. But at that point in your lifetime, as we're talking about the 11 to 17 year olds, their identity is still forming. That's right. And so for you to tell them that they're not accepted, that who they are is not okay, um, that they don't meet some kind of standard that you want them to have, I imagine could have very devastating effects on a young person who expects nothing but love and support, right? Ideally, from parents and other people in their families and to not feel like they can truly be themselves, that mm -hmm. must be devastating. It is. I think it, it takes a toll on them. Absolutely. And then as we talk about, you know, our students of color who are also dealing with probably race issues on top of some of these other things, um, higher risk factors, maybe for some health problems. You mentioned uh, some of the... Um, I guess, challenges that families may be dealing with in terms of family dysfunction. We know we're seeing a lot of aggression and crime um, in our community and that a lot of young people are struggling to raise themselves, essentially, and that they're mm -hmm. looking to gangs or looking to um, mechanisms to get income to be able to take care of themselves and to get that support. And of course, that is not going to bode well for their mental health. Right. And, and, and that's true. And another thing that we have to realize that um, a lot of times our children, children of color are not diagnosed with the depression, but they're diagnosed with most, most severe, harsh diagnosis. So, I mean, if our children were to go mistreated from those diagnoses, whereas people, other people, um, Caucasian people will be more diagnosed and treated for it also, but our children do get more of the opposition, opposition defiant, just bad kids, just don't want to do anything, just lazy. You know, those are the things that, that I see when maybe a parent would bring their ch child to me after they've been with someone else and, and things like that. So that's something to be aware of too. Our kids are always sometimes seen as negative behavior instead of trying to pinpoint and target what is really going on with that child what's underneath the behavior That's instead right. of these labels mm -hmm. that they yeah. end up. So, so one of our viewers, Tony Brady, asked what part do we think that socioeconomics might play into that? So for maybe for our, our young kids who are growing up in areas that may have more poverty, uh, what may be some of the things that may be contributing in terms of those risk factors? Well, I think we have to look at nutrition. Um, you know, because I did a workshop, couple, I think last week, I think I get my day so busy, but, <laughs> but, you know, um, diet, we want to look at nutrition, uh, we want to make sure they get enough sleep, uh, we want to make sure that we're incorporating parent time, and parents, we want to make sure that we're educating and teaching our kids at home on different things. And I think teaching them how to develop um, socialization skills and, and things like that. But I think that poverty do play a role, you know, but I do, um, we do know that now what research shows us is that um, diet, nutrition plays a very significant role um, in the development of the brain, Absolutely. you know, so you want to make sure that they're getting enough protein, you know, certain things in, in food that they eat, not eating a whole lot of red meat and things like that. But I think that being able to develop close relationship with your children, motivate them, encourage them and praise them, I think will go a long way, even if, they, you know, you do live in poverty. Because I think that if there are in poverty, sometimes parents are doing the best that they can do with what they have. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you brought up a good point about the nutrition piece, because that's one of the things we're dealing with right now is the cost of everything is going up. How, you know, the difficulty people are having finding formula for their babies, mm -hmm. um, leave, living in potential food deserts where you don't have fresh fruits and vegetables. Or it may be that those things are more expensive to eat healthier, whereas things that are processed are a little cheaper, right? So I can get some Kraft macaroni and cheese, maybe mm -hmm. a little cheaper than I might be able to get some of those fresh 
uh, fruits and vegetables and being able to make that macaroni and cheese from scratch. So that also may be a deterring factor as well in terms of nutrition. I've often seen kids grab and go for breakfast, right? So they're grabbing chips and they're grabbing mm -hmm. um, juice and not eating necessarily a real meal. And sometimes for those students, if they're not able to get to school on time to be able to get to breakfast, then they may not necessarily have a nutritious meal to start their day. And how does that affect their behavior? We know red dye. Uh, we know that not getting enough sleep, like you said, we know that not getting enough nutrients affects our young people's behavior. So that's that one, what's underneath that you were talking about before. Like we're just labeling you as a bad kid, but we're not looking at yeah. what might be these other socioeconomic factors that may be contributing to why you're struggling. Yes. And, and that's a good point because we have a lot uh, we have a lot of children that may be on medication. But just think about if we're giving if that child is taking maybe some ADHD medication and eating chips, that's why you're having a counter reaction with that medication, you know, um, because it's not meant to be taken that way. That's an excellent point, too, to go back to what you said earlier about sometimes our kids are overdiagnosed or overmedicated, um, and then they could be underdiagnosed and undermedicated, mm -hmm. right? And so being able to make sure you're with the appropriate provider to ensure that your child is getting the services they need, but also that you have this working relationship with your provider. So if there are things you are noticing, because we may not necessarily know about that diet, we might, right? So because the kid may not necessarily be forthcoming about what they're taking their medication with, but as we work with the parents, we may be able to understand like, oh yeah, so they're not getting enough protein. They're not getting enough vegetables. They're not getting enough rest. Maybe we've got somebody um, that's living around us that's really loud. Some of our young people are in neighborhoods uh, where there is a lot of violence. And so there may be gunshots, there may be police sirens, all of these things interfering with a young person sleep. And so how does that affect their development as well in terms of I'm growing up in an environment where I'm constantly having to be on alert, um, fight or flight. And so am I going to be able to regulate some of this activity during the day when I'm so used to having to be on guard and vigilant all the time? That's right. Because that type of environment can be very, can be very traumatic to children. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are some of the signs, right? So if our young people are dealing with depression and anxiety, what do parents need to be on the lookout for to, to recognize when their kids may be struggling? Okay. What we do know when you're dealing with teens, sometimes they're usually often, often moody anyhow. And sometimes we can overlook that is them being depressed. You know, because they, you know, like you said, there's that stage where they're going to that stage of development and, you know, the hormones and everything are all. So we might get some little attitude back from them sometimes. But I think that some things that we should look at is things like avoiding to hang out with families and friends like they used to. Um, <clears throat> being sad or angry more often. They're not doing well in school. They're either sleeping too much or sleeping less. And they just seem irritable. You know, they want to be more isolated, don't want to be around people, you know, uh, things like that. So those are some things that, you know, you can watch because all children, you know, all they're different. But you, I think that parents and caregivers, you know your children better than anyone else. So you're able to discern if something is off. That's, you know, what's going on. And I think when you when you see that they're kind of like, not like they used to be, I think you need to have that conversation to find out is everything okay. You Absolutely. Know? So asking those questions, checking in. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when our kids are, are irritable and angry or isolating themselves, we think they're just being moody and we leave them alone. But I'm hearing you say that's no, that's when you need to be checking on them because there's a reason why they're engaging in this particular behavior. And some of it, yeah, we know, like you said, our teens can be a little moody, but there's a difference between being a little moody and then that agitation, aggression, irritability that you were talking about and withdrawing, mm -hmm. that's a different, um, you know, not wanting to be around people, not wanting to be engaged. Right. So that sounds like that's a, a, that's a telltale sign. Something's going on. I need to be asking some questions. Right, yeah, we need to just just ask questions. I think that, you know, sometimes, um, well, what I've seen throughout my years of practice is that children don't um, act out without a reason. 
there's usually an undercross reason. And, and I think sometimes we have to explore that and we have to, you know, search to try to find out, you know, what's going on. Absolutely. So beyond the behavior, there's mm -hmm. always going to be something that is underneath that we need to be looking at and not just get to the, you're lazy, you're bad, mm -hmm. um, you're being a jerk, right? So all these labels, because we can fall in that to, to that as well. Um, you just act like this all the time instead of truly understanding what is underneath this behavior. There's something okay. that this child may be trying to communicate with me and they may not have the words to be able to do it. Right, and because what we have to realize that children, adolescents, what the ages that we're talking about, you know, they don't process things like we do. So sometimes I say if we can remember how this pandemic has been confusing for us in, as adults, can you imagine what it has been like for the children? And that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Think yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think sometimes um, we forget about that. Absolutely. Because we think they're little mini adults, but they're not. They're children. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What about our younger ones under 11? Are they at risk as well for some depression, anxiety, and what might be the signs in them? Do they look a little different than they might look in our adolescents? What we see in um, under 11, 3% of uh, what research has shown us is that 3% of children under that age group will have, um, can develop depression. Um, under that age group, during that age group, we see mostly, um, it's more common in boys. Once we get to age 16, it's more prevalent in females or girls. Um, but some of the same symptoms, you know, change in appetites, in their appetite, um, their eating, their sleeping and activities, Social isolation, uh, sometimes talk of suicide, uh, hopelessness or helplessness. I can't do anything right. Sometimes, you know, we, they get criticized because they're not doing what they're supposed to do in, in school and things like that. We look at um, increased um, risk-taking behaviors, doing things where they can hurt themselves is what we'll see. Frequent, they're having frequent frequent accidents, and also substance abuse. But when we talk about substance abuse now, parents have to realize it's not, most people would think like uh, drugs, but we got to look at these um, things that we have in our cabinets and things like that is what I have mostly sometimes dealt with with kids, like inhaling gas can, gas from the, the father, one more, um, case in the in the garage and things like that so you you know you look at other things that you might have in your home um, we do have kids who are addicted to that so you'll see changes with that because we're not not all not always you know the alcohol and the drugs because there may not be um too, they may be too young to get that but there's other things that they can use to, to do the drugs um negative things you i've had uh, children that would draw pictures or even if they've sent to me from the school, they'll draw pictures of them killing someone with blood and everything. So you, a theme in all of their writings, when they were write papers, everything have such a negative theme. So those are things that you want, if you see that, those are things that you definitely want to be able to explore with that child so you can get up in here and find out what's going on. Um, they talk about death and dying um, or in that age group. Um, you may see increase in crying or emotional expression. And sometimes they will start to give away uh, possessions, um, you know, to friends or families and things like that. So those are some of the ones that you would see in that age group, 11 year old and younger. That's an excellent point about the using household uh, items. So the gas can the the paint that we might mm -hmm. have around glue, glue. Um, you know and even the, the self-harm behaviors with the cutting so we, you know the the stapler the 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 scissors um, you know things that you don't think about because your your young person has access to them the, the markers they can be huffing on um, so a lot of different ways that kids can I've seen kids swallow things mm -hmm. um, so they'll just ingest things uh, that are around the house um, we've got all of this 
uh, you know, hand sanitizer around now Mm -hmm. uh, that kids can. So I think that is important for parents to monitor. Uh, You know, it used to be we'd have the the mouthwash that had a lot of alcohol in it. And so kids may be doing that or or, uh, trying to get the cold medicine Mm -hmm. um, that's in the cabinet. So I think that's very important for parents to be monitoring where these substances, uh, I'm going to call them substances because they can be used as such, um, are kept in homes and making sure that they are put in places where they can be monitored in using them and not just given free access. Right. And when we talk about, you know, the self-harming behavior, you really have to watch because they're getting smart with this. Mm -hmm. They do it in places where you're not going to see it. So, you know, areas where it's not easy for you to, to locate on their bodies. Which that whole, like them being, uh, very secretive comes in. So, Mm -hmm. you, you know, most kids, Aren't, aren't that bashful where they might walk around without a top or in their little underwear or something and, and you're noticing that they're constantly covered up. Um, mm-hmm. And so those areas that you wouldn't be able to see when you're like, you come in when they're getting dressed and they're like, oh my God, you know, and they're responding um, because they don't want you to see that that cut that's under a shirt mm-hmm. or on a pair of shorts or, or pants. So you're absolutely right. That's good too. So it is important for us to be watching our kids, even when they may not be aware that we're watching them in terms of making sure they're not engaging in any self-harm behaviors, whether that's cutting or burning um, or bruising themselves with objects, all of those things, yes. Uh, What about anxiety, Dr. Pass Turner? Because I know that, you know, most kids probably at some point in their life have been a little anxious our kids may be, uh, you know, crying, don't want us to leave them at daycare or the first couple of days of school, they're a little nervous. So they're clinging to us a little bit more or we move to a new city and they're a little bit more anxious. But what are some signs that anxiety may be more than just situational and it's gotten to, gotten to a point where it's causing significant distress and they may need a little more support? Almost time when it's occurring more frequently. And not only is it occurring more frequently, but it's interfering with the social and the daily function of that child. An example would be, you notice whenever um, you drop that child off at school, that child starts to have panic attack. You start to see shortness of breath, anxiousness, crying, you know, that's something to be concerned about. Um, so, so things like that, because, you know, we all have anxiety. And, and sometimes it just comes certain, situ- like you said, situational. We're usually able to work through it. These people with more, so kids with more severe anxiety, they're not able to work through it unless they do get into some therapy and learn some appropriate strategies and cope or coping skills to help them. So, you know, um, some kids get ready to take an exam. They can't make it through the exam because they're worried. They have extensive worry. They're worried about if they're going to pass the exam. But you can't even get to the exam to answer the questions. So you don't end up finishing the exam. And of course, you're going to fail the exam. So I see a, a lot of children that deal with a lot of uh, test anxiety, anxiety at school, anxiety worried about nobody likes me. You know, I don't have any friends. You know, just 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 all of that. But when it starts to interfere with their overall well-being, that's when you know it's an issue. It's like I said, we all have stress, we all have anxiety, and some of us are able to cope with it a lot better than others. And it doesn't affect us. For the ones who don't, you're going to see some anxiousness, uh, worrying, stressed out about everything, self-doubt. You know. You may see some social anxiety with that because they can't communicate appropriately. I've heard people say, children say that when they try to communicate with their peers, they lose their voices. Mm. They can't properly communicate because they're so nervous and anxious. You know, so those are just some things to kind of look for and and to know if it's happening, if it's occurring more frequently, then you definitely need to see about getting that child treatment to help better self-regulate. That brings me back to a point you made earlier about how it it flips. Um, You know, males are more anxious at the younger ages and then females become more anxious at the older ages. And I'm wondering about that social 
piece. And so is that some of that rumination that our girls may be having about if they're being liked, if people are going to accept them, if uh, they're going to be in a, in a group where they find a fit, um, or are they going to feel like they're ostracized or rejected mm -hmm. in some way? Um, and then you mentioned too, the test anxiety, but also that anxiety that uh, kids can have comparing themselves to other kids. Yes. Um, you know, if you have siblings, you have that sibling who is a star, insert whatever, the star athlete or the star on the debate team or um, the star at, at being able to complete essays or great at math, and you're struggling in those areas. So now you're comparing yourself, so you're ruminating about mm -hmm. if you're enough and you're worth, then mm -hmm. you're going to be able to do this. So you're sick, but like you said, before you even get in the school, your stomach's all upset, it's in knots. Um, and so you're just so worried about the social aspect, the, the academic aspect, and then you may be carrying some things going on in your family, you may feel responsible mm -hmm. for parents um, okay. or trying to be the good child because there's a, there's a child in the family that's having a lot of concerns and you don't want to cause, you know, your parents or your other loved ones any more distress. So you try to uh, make sure that you're the model kid and it's causing you a lot of anxiety. Yes, because we know that they have a tendency, people with anxiety or children, anyone, a tendency to worry a lot. And they're always, what if, what if? Um, but I always tell them, you know, put a period right there and stop it. <laughs> don't go any further, you know. Not the question, don't, but the period. You know, put a period there and don't dig a deeper hole. Learn how to just, this is it, right here, you know. Um, but yes, they have a tendency to worry a lot, and children do at that age compare themselves with others because at this age, and what we're talking about, you know, the, the friends are more important than the parents. We don't know anything. And so they want their approval at that point. And like you said, because um, that's the identity um, versus confusion and the psychosocial you know, um, stages. And so they're going through that, you know? So yes, Absolutely. that makes sense. Which is why those relationships can give them more anxiety because mm -hmm. what if I'm not dating anyone or what if I don't mm -hmm. have a large group of friends or, you know, what if I don't have a, a, a crowd that I'm a part of at school right. because maybe I'm not on a team or something. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, it gives me anxiety to it go in me. there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so when we go back and we talk about the LBGTQ, just imagine, you know, what they have to experience at that stage of development, too, because that's the stage where they are searching for the identity. And I'm feeling one way I've been told that it's it can't be that way, that you can't you don't know what you what you are at that age. You haven't experienced life yet. You, you don't know and, and things like that. So it, it does cause an increase in anxiety, anxiousness. And sometimes I see it a lot with um uh, moving, military kids moving from different states and, and, and trying to come in and assimilate into a new school and, and new friends and things like that. Too. And you are so right about some of the messages we inadvertently give and don't realize how harmful those are. You don't know yet. You're mm -hmm. still figuring things out. Like, yeah. I mean, how dismissive is that to tell a kid? Because if you were were um, a cisgender kid, <laughs> like I wouldn't tell you that. Uh, if you're a straight kid, I'm not telling you that, right? I'm only saying that to you if you identify as LGBTQ um, plus, or, mm -hmm. or I may be saying to you, you need to assimilate in a group if you're a, a person of color. Uh, well, you need to be more like this. You need to be this model um, of your ethnicity or your, uh, you need to represent for your whole uh, ethnic group. Like, and that's so much pressure to put on mm -hmm. a kid, or I'm negatively labeled as a result of, of my ethnicity. Uh, and so now I can't get from underneath that label because all you see when you look at me is whatever that negative label you have of me is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and some other things too <clears throat> that can contribute to uh, anxiousness and anxiety. We look at parents fighting or arguing all the time. That's not a healthy environment for your child. That contributes to, to anxiety also. And sometimes the death of a close relative or a friend also. Like we say, we've got a lot of um, shooting violence that we're dealing with now, you know, and that is impacting uh, our children. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What are some ways parents can support their kids? Because I'm hearing that like your kid is probably at risk for something. Um, you're going to struggle with something, whether it's academically or socially or anxiety or depression or peer groups or uh, relationships, something. There is going to be an area where there may be some difficulty for your child. How can parents support their children? I think the most important things that we have to do as parents is listen knowing that all, all children are different, okay? So as you listen and talk to your, your, your child and if something comes up, you know, you wanna see how you can address that. If you can't address it yourself, then you reach out to others to help others, you know, maybe a problem with the teacher in school, you know? Okay, that's calling, causing you a lot of, you know, stress and anxiety, let me have a conference and let's see if we can find out, is she really feeling that way? Or is she picking on you or is it, is it just you? And things like that. But I think it's just important to listen and to try to understand what's going on. And then see then from there, you can make a plan on what do I need to do? If your child do have some anxieties, there are some coping skills and, and strategies and things that you can teach them. And, no, and, and one way to make sure that they get better um, is to have them practice. If you see your child is anxious or upset about something, talk them through, what about the technique I just taught you about breathing? Let's try that, you know, um, because if they, the more they practice, um, the better it will get, it'll get, it'll get better. We can't say when you have anxiety because it's almost like a chronic condition. It's not going to just go away. Right. But what you will do, you'll be able to cope with it. So that means once that anxiety comes, you have the ability to work through it. And this is my favorite line that I tell everybody, adults or children. If you have anxiety and it's a severe anxiety, and the, the, reason, the reason why you're here with me because it's, it has affected your way of living. Mm -hmm. Because it has controlled you for all these years. So what we're going to do now, we're going to flip the script. We're going to put you in control of the anxiety. Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell that anxiety when I want you to come. So whenever it's come, you're going to put in those strategies or those coping skills to de-escalate that anxiety. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like that because it empowers our young people. Uh, you were talking earlier about you know, the importance of parents being present with their children or, or whoever, guardians, loved ones, whoever's in the life of this child being present. We often, we take a lot of things away from kids, but we don't give them things to put in their place. So I'm taking, I'm telling you can't be mouthy. I'm telling you need to change this behavior, but I'm not giving you the resources to be able to do anything different. So I've got to teach you coping skills. Emotional regulation isn't something we're born with, it's something we're taught. Mm -hmm. So learning how to be able to manage the stress that I have in my life is something that we are taught. And so it's very important for parents to work with kids on these skills and allow them to practice uh, so that they will be able to handle the things that come up. Because I heard you say something very powerful. It's not that you will never experience this. It's that you will learn how to conquer it or at the very least cope with it so it doesn't cause you such significant right. distress. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's very important to see what we see with children with these issues. If they don't learn how to control it during these stages, that what we're talking about now, these age groups, they grow up to adults, and it's even worse. Oh yes. So we need to teach our kids how they use their exec executive functioning skills, along with self regulation, because if we can do it now they're going to be a whole lot better when they become adults and they're faced with so many stressors that we know that we have. Absolutely. You know, so, so prevention. You, preventive uh, method is, the, is what we have to do. You have to teach them how. And that's how you um, produce healthy adults. Absolutely. And what we do in early childhood. Absolutely. And adolescence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate you saying that because it does get harder to be able to learn those skills as adults because now you've had 10, 15, 20 years of practice with some of these um, difficulties that you've experienced. And now you have to unlearn that and also the effects that it's had on your body because you weren't able to get that foundation of learning how to manage 
And so now I may have had problems with crime, uh, violence. Uh, I may have had problems with maintaining employment. I may have had difficulty being able to finish school. And so it showed up in all of these financial issues, showed up in all these negative ways, weight. Um, and so now I'm trying to have to undo that, which is much more difficult than being able to prevent it from have happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yes. A um, question came from a viewer. We were talking earlier about how we can sometimes be dismissive of our young people uh, when they approach us about their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And so the question was posed, at what age do kids start thinking about their gender identity and their sexual orientation? Ooh. I had a five-year-old boy wearing dresses. So <laughs> it's younger and younger now. And, and I don't know um, what it is, you know, is it, I, I have no idea, but um, a five-year-old at five year at five years old, he felt that he was a female in a male body, um, body, and it was a mistake. And he would, he would wear dresses um, to my sessions with him. And his mom says, but well, that's what he wanted to wear, you know? I, I, I can't really answer that because yeah. I, I do know, how, you know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, but uh, it's interesting because time is so different now. Mm -hmm. Children are so much well advanced because they, they see so much. There's so much in society. And I think that some of the, the things that they see um, is so confusing sometimes. You know, what we see on TV, two men in relationship, women in relationship. Just imagine, you know, so I, I, I can't answer that, but I just know, you know, just uh, parents, I've seen parents that would tell me that, you know, I kind of knew at an early age that um, he, you know, he had those type of behaviors. So I'm not surprised. You know. and, and that's the thing, like, as we talk about um, development across the, the lifespan, we all develop at different ages, right? So we have some of those developmental milestones, but there's typically a range um, in which we hit them. But we do know that often our young people, as their brains are developing and maturing, yeah, four, five, six years old, um, it isn't necessarily um, sexual at that time. But it may be that I have a more of an affinity toward this gender, or I may have more of an affinity toward um, what I like to wear uh, at that age. We start seeing our kids have preferences for what clothes they want to put on, um, for how they like their hair, uh, for who they like to spend time with. Um, and you'll see little kids and they just blush um, and you say, are you flirting already? Uh, so, but we do experience those things earlier. Now we do like to, unfortunately, um, we, we try to put adult behaviors on children, their children. And so we don't need to make it um, something that's more sexualized. Um, then it is like, okay, so they like a boy or they like a girl or they like these heels or they like this dress or um, they like to uh, climb trees or they like to wear more pants. And they don't want to put on the dress uh, and you might want them to, right? And being able to be more fluid with our kids and allowing them to figure that out. Because as you said, like we're still figuring it out. So, you know, not putting these negative labels on our children and saying, don't do that. You can't wear that. I don't... You know, and because that does cause them not to feel like they can be open and honest with us. It feels like they need to hide. And we don't want them to feel like they need to hide. We want them to be in a space. I love, I was watching on this news, on the news this morning, how now uh, the men and women's soccer team will have one pool of money. And so they'll all be getting paid because there's been such a gender fight for women in soccer, women athletes everywhere, but women in soccer have taken on this fight. Uh, because they are traditionally paid much less, even though we know the women's soccer team is the soccer team that wins. Um, so we don't want our children to grow up in spaces where they feel like they have to be something instead of just allowing them to be kids. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Were you going to say something else? No, we're good. Okay. Um, so I want to spend um, a little bit of time before we move on to talking about your books 
we know that kids have anxiety. We know they have depression. But you mentioned ADHD earlier, and we know that oppositional defiance you mentioned earlier. So what are some other things that our kids could be experiencing? Because we throw around a lot of letters and a lot of names sometimes, and parents are like, what is that? What does that mean? So talk a little bit about what are maybe some of the other things that our kids might be experiencing. Um, well, we talked about the opposition to fight, which I really despise that diagnosis. <laughs> uh, because when I see that, it, it means that you have no hope for that child. There's, there's no hope that child is not going to get better, you know. And I've seen kids who have come to me with that diagnosis and I've worked with them and they have gotten better. So I, I really, you know, but another one was um, any type of explosive disorder that we have, which means that no impulse control, you know, I see that a lot with, with, with um, children of color, um, conduct disorders and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like I say, most of them are most of the, the negative ones, which, you know, you really can't cure. So I, I, I had parents say, I, my child went to this provider. He says, well, there's nothing else he can do. He's just going to be that way. Well, I refuse to believe that. So I'm going to do everything I can with you helping me so that we can help this child, you know, and things like that. But any, any of the diagnoses that are, that are really a lot more severe and it's like, there's no hope. There's just nothing. We're not going to be able to, this child's not going to get better. Mm -hmm. Telling a parent that you just have to accept this because it's not, you know, I disagree with that. And there may be some that, you know, that might not um, get better. But I, I have to say, and I'm blessed and I thank God that the ones that I've worked with, mm -hmm they've had some improvement and that's what it's all about. But it takes the parents, myself, and even the school, mm -hmm. you know, sharing, sharing information with the parents, share this with the teacher, you know, ask her if she can put the stop sign on his desk or put the stop sign somewhere in the classroom. So, and then when he ever, he, he seems to veer off to the left, you say, um, do you remember that stop sign over there? You know, and things like that. But yeah, that's so my, my favorite. I do that with adults. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, but but things like that. But just like like I said, the, the opposite, you know, those are the main ones, the, the main ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to just thank you for being an advocate for our young people, because, you know, we talk about one of the major factors for depression is hopelessness. So if someone tells you you're mm -hmm. never going to get better, like imagine how you will feel as a kid, like okay, I'm just going to be bad or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm never going to be anything um, and how that's going to affect your worth and also how it's going to affect your ability to be able to be successful in life if no one supports and believes in you. Yeah, it's going to be tough, but like you said, we'll learn how to cope with it. We'll learn how to, how to manage it. Um, and I'm happy to hear you, you know, really point out that boys frequently get that oppositional defiant mm -hmm. um, or the, um, you know, uh, emotional dysregulation kind of um, disorders, the uh, being very mm -hmm. explosive, intermittent, absolutely. Um, and, and that oftentimes that's what ends them getting put in schools uh, where they don't get a chance to have the same academic opportunities that other students do. When you get that label so early on in your life, it's mm -hmm. hard to shake it. Yes, because they start the first thing when they get your paperwork, the first thing they're looking at is that, that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And automatically, we have bias. Yes. Unconscious bias. And so that person's mind is already made up about how I'm going to deal with this child. Absolutely. Before you actually begin to, to deal with that person. Absolutely. You know, I don't believe that there's bad children. And, and how I try to, because when, like you said, I don't want them to feel, I don't want them to have poor self esteem. I don't want them to think that they're bad. But when I tell them that, you know, someone may say you're bad, it's not you, it's just the things that you're doing. It's your behavior. And because, and because that, that the badness isn't within you, right. we have the ability to change it. Absolutely. So we're going to, we're going to work on that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Separate so you from your so behavior. Separating you from yes, your behavior. Absolutely. Yes, you know, absolutely. and, and um, that's what I think, you know, that helps, you know, absolutely. it helps because then it gives us a starting point. And, and what do you want to do? I want to improve my behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so let's shift gears because I want to make sure we have time for you to discuss. Um, uh, it's over on my shelf. I was going to pull it out. Um, Rex's journey. So mm -hmm. we were just talking about the importance of teaching our kids how to cope how to have strategies to be able to deal with some of the challenges they may experience. And you have created a resource that is going to assist parents and people who work with children or who have children in their families with allowing them to learn these coping schools skills. So tell us about Rex's journey. How did you get there? Uh, and, and what do you hope to come out of this book? Well, basically, I like writing. And so what I write books about are things that I've seen throughout the years. And so I use the coping strategies and things that I have used that I know have been successful. Because you see, it's impossible for me to see every kid. And when I tell you I'm already on July schedule scheduling people, I have no availability. It's very limited these days, yes. which is a good thing. It is. <laughs> um, so. I decided to write books because I felt like I can still teach. I can still teach them the coping skills, even though if I'm not seeing them, because it's easy to follow. I think it's important that children learn executive functioning and self-regulation early in life. And the books that I continue to write will focus on executive functioning and self-regulation. So that means I'm gonna target their work and memory, mm -hmm their mental flexibility and self-control. So Rex's journey is about this child that experienced various emotions and he doesn't understand. And so we take, we take him through the different journey, journey and the pictures are beautiful. You know, um, he gets in trouble. The kids in school are not playing with him. And he gets sent to the principal office. So you see the principal on the phone calling his mom, <laughs> you know, things like that. And so, they put Rex in some counseling and he learned how to self-regulate, you know, these different coping skills. So that's what it's all about, just teaching children um, how to better understand what they're going through and knowing that they have the ability to work through it, you know. I mean, how powerful is that for kids to have a resource, a book, um, and I'm going to pull Rex out here in a second, but how important and powerful it is for kids to have a book where they see themselves. Yes. Right? We, we talk about how much representation matters because then I don't feel so broken. Mm -hmm. Then I don't feel like there's no hope for me. Then I don't feel like all I can be is whatever someone labeled me to be. It gives me, like you said, that empowerment of, hey, I can learn how to better manage my behavior. I just need the right skills. And, and, you know, being able to tackle the emotional regulation and the executive functioning, because a lot of times we don't recognize that this part of our brain is where our reason and our judgment is, which is still developing in our young kids. And as we talked about earlier, as we, earlier, we think there are many adults. They're not many adults. This isn't mm -hmm. even fully formed yet. So they're still running off a lot of impulse. <laughs> They're still trying to regulate, right? So we have to help in the creation of this by being able to teach them skills instead of penalizing them and beating them up and, and talking bad about them when they don't have skills, they have not been taught. That's right. We, we, we have to teach them. And- um, You keep going, I'm gonna get your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, have to, we have to teach them because if they don't know, they don't know. And when we do know, we have a tendency to do better. So, and, and one thing I do like about the book because I give it, a, I give it out a lot. I, use, I give it out a lot in, in, in my practice to kids when, you know, when they're having, you know, behavior issues and problems. And, and, and sometimes kids would say, Rex looks like me, you know, uh, I had, you know, or uh, 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 African-American kids would say, can relate to it. I had a, a Mexican kid that says, Rex looks like me. And, and, and that's great. Um, Rex does look like he could be a little Mexican. <laughs> a little curly hair. So you can, uh, you know, so each kid can, can see themselves in the book. It's a multicultural book. I, I try to write, all, have all my books multicultural so that every, every child can see and can see themselves in that book and can relate to themselves. So that's very important to me. And I think it's important for parents to feel like 
they have a resource too. As you said, you can't see everyone. We know that sometimes it can be really difficult to one, to find a, a, a good culturally competent provider, uh, but two, also to be able to manage getting the therapy, to manage affording therapy, all of the competing interests that families often have. And so being able to have skills to use with your child, to practice a book that they can be doing if, if they're in therapy, even between sessions, uh -huh. to be able to practice these skills. And this is something that will continue to grow with them. So they'll have this resource to go back to and reflect on. Uh, and, and, you know, can feel, you can feel hopeless as a parent sometimes about, you know, did I do something wrong? Like, why is my child having these problems? And you get frustrated and then you're upset because you got frustrated and you didn't respond in the way that you wanted to. And so it can feel very overwhelming. But here are some nice practical skills that parents can have as a tool to be able to assist their child with learning how to regulate um, and also deal with the issues of executive functioning as well. Now, but you're having, you have another book specifically coming out to address um, ADHD. So talk a little bit about that one too. Well, um, the title of this book is um, ADHD War, Helping Children Conquer ADHD Unwanted Behavior. And this, the start of this book is Roxy. And uh, I think she's- So a girl. A girl. Okay. She's named after my dog, Roxy. <laughs> it's my dog. She's the star of this book. And my dog, Rex, Rex. is actually the star of Rex's journey. So they're my babies. But anyway, this is Roxy. And uh, it, it, what this is, teaches you, it, it, it takes you on, she's telling you that she has ADHD. And she talks to, you're going to be able to see in this book, what does a child with ADHD go through? She's got to take you through the process from the process that first start when um, the teacher tell her parents that we think that, you know, there's something going on and she goes to the doctor and, um, you know, and the parents, they meet with the doctor and the parents decide that, well, we're not going to go with medication, you know, but you'll get to see all of the different things that she's doing at school things that she's doing at home. So you're actually going to see that. And then you're going to see, you're going to see the mother based on the information that the physician provided to them, putting it in place and coming up with some strategies to better help her um, cope through the, um, to be able to cope with ADHD and make it through. Now, plus we know the ADHD is, is, is a chronic condition, you know, but if you do the right things, if you make some changes, you're not going to see it 100% disappear, but you are going to be able to see some improvement. So that's what it is about Roxy. You just, um, it's going to teach you how to conquer and it has some great, um, some great things, techniques and things to do um, to help your children. And also parents, it is very important, you know, you have to practice these things at home with your children when they have ADHD. You have to do certain things so that it will transition into the school environment. If you're teaching it at home, when they get into that school environment, they're going to remember and you're going to have less issues and less calls from the teacher. So the home, the structure, and the organization is where everything starts. That's the foundation. Everything else is built off of what you do with these kids at home that leads to success and being able to manage ADHD and not allowing it to be a hinder for them. That's really powerful to be able to, because I know a lot of parents have concerns about their kids and medication, right? So we don't want to just start our children necessarily on medication right away. Uh, behavioral strategies, the structure, the organization, um, the taking time with them at home, the helping them break things down into smaller tasks, um, not giving them so many things at one time uh, so they can actually focus on one task. and get. So those things sound like they're really going to be helpful for parents who may have a child that they suspect has ADHD or has been diagnosed with ADHD because some people do still believe it's made up. Um, mm -hmm. And that kids are just lazy um, and they're not applying themselves and they just need a good old whooping. Uh, and so this sounds like this is going to allow people to be able to really see what a child deals with when they have executive functioning challenges. Yes, it's going to take you through it. You can actually see it. And the um, illustration is going to be great. You can, you're going to be able to relate to that 
my point is when you see it, you say, yeah, that's her, that's him, that's who we're dealing with, and that's the whole idea. But I think we have to, um, like you said, is, you know, train them at home, and it, it will help them um, to, to better develop and be able to cope with the ADHD. But medication doesn't cure all, because the medication only lasts, what, six, seven, eight hours or whatever. Yeah, they got so, extended release. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, but you need to, even if your child is on medication, you still need to teach that child coping skills. And that's very important too, because yeah, a lot of times important. people think I can only do one or the other. Uh-uh. You're saying, hey, you can do both. Like we can try a lot of different things. We also know yoga can help with executive uh-huh. function. We know diets, as you were talking about earlier, can uh-huh. help with some of those executive functions. We know adequate rest. So all of yeah. these things um, can assist. And so I'm hearing you say you can use a variety of different things to help support your young person who uh-huh. may be dealing with issues of inattention uh-huh. and, or, and or hyperactivity. Uh-huh. And even if they're on the medication, you still teach them the coping strategies also, because that's going to make the medication even more effective. Absolutely. So yeah. how can people purchase? We know that um, the ADHD book is still in, in progress, but how can people pur- purchase Rex's journey or are they able to purchase Anxiety Warrior early? Um, well, actually, um, what we're looking at is um, in August. We're looking at August um, because how we're going to launch this book, um, Care Source has teamed up with me. And so we're going to launch this at different schools throughout Georgia, the regions oh, that wow. they're served. So we're going to have different um, book launches at different schools. Okay. So we're looking at when school starts back, and I'm sure we'll, we'll choose some schools here in Muskogee County, but we're actually going to have some book launches in school. Um, and I'm amazing. sure that um, Care Source will give some books out um, to the students and things like that. And then, then I will have my you know, regular book launch. Um, but the, um, a, the Rex's Journey, you can purchase that on my, on my website, site drambrosepasturner-.com, or you can purchase at any of online or any of the um, bookstores, um, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, any of those. If you just put in Rex's Journey, it'll just come up, but you can also come to my website too. That way I don't have to share the profit. <laughs> <laughs> that part. So give them that website one more time. <laughs> it's uh, Dr. Ambrose pass turnercom Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. We're so excited for your book launch um, that's going to be upcoming. Uh, because we know the importance of giving our kids resources. And so how amazing is that, that you're partnering with CareSource to get these books into the schools, into kids' hands who can actually benefit from them. I want to thank you again for being a guest on Tea Time with Dr. Tarver. We appreciate the work that you're doing in our community with our young people and their guardians um, to ensure that our young people are getting what they need, because we all know how important an advocate is. Thank you, Dr. Tarver. And like I said, I appreciate you inviting me. Absolutely. You can follow Tea Time with Dr. Tarver on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and your favorite listening platforms. Also want to let you know that we have upcoming We Do Say Gay, Parenting HIV AIDS and Challenging Stigma with Tony Christian Walker, Tuesday, May 24th at 7.30, and My Transition Story, Becoming Byron Omari, Tuesday, May 31st, 7.30 p.m., and these are all Eastern Standard Time. Thank you again, Dr. Pass Turner and everybody be well.